Um, and before that, I worked in healthcare building predictive models in clinical settings to actually help clinicians make better decisions at the point of care. Um, to give a little bit of the outline talk, I'll give some general background about model interpretability, and then I'm also going to introduce a toolkit that uh, I've developed at very early phases, but that I've developed with uh, my colleague Ramesh Sampat, who's also an instructor at Metis. And we'll go through some examples of how you can use it and point you to some resources if, if you decide you want to use it on your own. So to give a little background, so, so in the beginning, you know, years ago, regression, linear regression was kind of the only game in town, right? And it was nice because it gave these very simple interpretations. You have a unit increase, and it always maps to some unit, uh, unit increase in your feature means a certain unit increase in your target variable. But, you know, there were also problems, right? Uh, interactions were basically ignored or you had to manually add them in. So the predictive performance was kind of only okay. Um, but the advantage was that the relationships were linear and thereby very, very easily to interpret. And this, for people who really cared about trying to explain the world, this is really important. They could run a regression and not even really worry about the quality of the prediction, but just say, hey, this gives me an explanation. Every unit increase in this means a, this much increase in my target. And then, you know, in the recent years, we've had increasingly more sophisticated tools in machine learning, such as random forest, boosting, deep neural networks. And these have really been shown to have superior predictive power. They do much better. They're much more accurate in predicting numerical variables, much more accurate in their classifications. Um, a lot of this strength comes from the fact that they can capture these high order dependencies without you having to manually put them in, right? They just kind of find them. Um, but one of, the, one of the disadvantages is that they lack the simple interpretations of the previous models. So uh, this comes up a lot when I, uh, as I'm teaching. When I teach these boot camps, my students will, you know, they'll do a linear regression model and then they'll do something like a random forest or boosting. They'll get better accuracy, better, uh, you know, lower errors. But they'll say to me, I want to talk about the linear regression model because I can just talk about the coefficient and explain things. Whereas when I do random forest and boosting, all I can do is talk about these importances which aren't really that meaningful. Um, so people end up wanting to use kind of less accurate models purely because they're more interpretable. So I've mentioned a little bit about this already. But um, you know, linear logistic regression, what happens? A unit increase always has the same effect. So the current value of your feature is irrelevant, whether you're going, so if you look at my point at the bottom, how much does an additional 100 square feet add to a home price? Well, if you're doing a regression model, it's going to say whether you're going from 600, feet to 600 square feet to 700 square feet, or going from 5,000 square feet to 5,100 square feet, that delta in home price is going to be the same regardless. And furthermore, it's going to be independent of all the other aspects of the model. It's going to be irrelevant, you know, whether this is a teardown, whether it's going to, you know, whether it's a really nice house, how many bedrooms it has, and so forth. And the reality is that these other features matter a lot, right? If, if it's a teardown house, then you don't care about how much, <laughs> how much square feet it has. Adding 100 square feet is going to add nothing to the value. Um, you know, but if it's a one-bedroom, 600-square-foot condo, maybe going to 700 square feet might have an outsized increase. Um, so why do we care about model interpretability? So I want to bring up three, three reasons why this is really important, and also talk a little bit about the domain of healthcare and how that adds another layer of importance to it. Um, one is just in general, you want to understand uh, and be able to explain to someone else what this model is doing and what features are important, right? So if you have a model, of, we're going to talk a little bit about a model about housing prices. You want to be able to say, what are the main features? What, what's really driving this model? What are kind of the more second tier important features? And which things actually you try to put in the model, but they actually don't really make a difference at all. Um, and this is important for building confidence. In a clinical setting, this becomes really important. Clinicians, if you want them to act on the results of your model, they really want to understand what's going on under the hood, what's driving this. Um, 
you know, is this mostly driven by vital signs like blood pressure and respiration rate? Uh, how much does this lab have an effect on it? Does that move the needle a lot if this value, if a lab value is this versus this? They want to be able to ask these questions and get answers to them in a way that builds confidence about the model. A second reason why it's important is to explain individual predictions. So this also comes up a lot in a clinical setting. People, some of the models I built were things like uh, patients who are at risk of deterioration. So we built the model and we actually operationalized one. And the most Im the immediate feedback that we got was, we need to have a reason for it. You're telling us this patient is deteriorating. We're coming into the room saying we've got to you know we've got to address this patient, but you're not telling me what's wrong. So now I'm at square one. I got to go through their chart and try to figure out what it was that your model saw, that's making it concerned. So in some cases, that that's really important. Um, we'll also get questions. For example, I've worked on things like readmissions models. And they'll be looking at two patients and they'll say, these two patients kind of seem similar, but you told me this one was high risk and this one was medium risk. You know, what's the difference? Why did your model find a difference between these two? Uh, and a third point, which is, I think, similar to the first one, but is worth calling out, is to evaluate the consistency and coherence of the model. So for example, if you have a model and your model has the property that if you make one lab value a little bit worse, it actually kind of improves its evaluation of the patient. That's going to, again, detract from confidence of the model. Even if it gives better predictive power overall, the fact that it has these sort of little anomalies or these little bumps might make people concerned about using it. And, and in a clinical setting, you also have things like legal issues where they might say, wow, this is crazy. You didn't alert on this patient, but if he was slightly healthier, you would have alerted on this patient. Um, so these topics are, are becoming really important. And as these models uh, become more and more central to all sorts of decisions that are made, really understanding, building confidence in it, and, and you know, addressing these issues is important. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the existing work on model interpretation. Um, one of the first things that you come across if you start diving into some of this is this notion of partial dependence. And, and Friedman mentioned this in, in the first paper where he's talking about boosting. Um, and the idea is to average the effect of a single variable, and I'll say marginally and empirically. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at this graphic, which I you know, stole from this paper that I'm citing below, um, you see here we have four patients, and they have different ages, BMI, and glucose values. Uh, and the idea is, what if we took all those patients and we gave them all a glucose of 100? What would our model kind of predict on average? So those low, low, high, low risks. Imagine those are probabilities, and we could average those probabilities. And now we say, when we move glucose from 100 to 130, now what's the average of the probabilities? And that would kind of give us, we could plot this point, this average performance, um, over all different values of glucose and come up with a line for glucose that would say, on average, on an average, I mean averaging across our entire data set, when we change glucose from 100 to 130 and every step along the way, what happens to the average uh, evaluation of that patient. This is a way to kind of get average performance. But one thing it's missing is kind of the individual variation. So if you say, OK, when I go from 100, at 100, my average risk is 10%. And at 130, my average risk is 20%. Um, that tells you something. But it doesn't tell you whether is that half the people are going from 10 to 50% and everybody else is, is staying the same or everybody is uniformly going up by 20 percentage points, or there's a very small number of people whose risk is really shooting up and everyone else is kind of staying the same. So you're missing some of the variation with these partial dependence plots. So then uh, another way to look at it is how do you preserve that variation? Well, you could take that same chart and now think of each data point plotting the predictions of each row kind of in this diagram. So I would take this first person with age of 50 and BMI of 29 and s plug in a whole range of glucose values and see how that person's uh, risk changes in trajectory. 
as I vary their glucose from a very low value to a very high value. And I could do that for each independent patient. And now I can kind of see the variability. Oh, for certain patients, it really shoots up. And maybe for some other patients, it just doesn't make a difference at all. Um, so this was an idea that, that you know, I'd had in the back of my mind, and then I, I saw that it had been you know, published about already. They were called ice plots, and, and the reference is here. Um, and what I like about this approach is very empirical. You're really looking at the black box and, and trying out different things and seeing what's the range of different possibilities. And then just to, to, to cite another source, so this is a recent article. I don't even think it's published yet because I only found it in archive. Um, but it's Ribeiro, Singh, and Gwestern. Um, and their idea is to create a locally interpretable model in the region of interest. So you've got some very com complicated model. But locally, I'm going to come up with something that's sort of very simple and therefore interpretable and use that to create my, my, uh, my interpretations. And one of the reasons I want to, to bring it up is because it's a very good reference document. They do a very thorough job of uh, you know, going through all the past work, uh, more so than I'm able to do in this talk. OK, so to talk a little bit about this, this package that, that I've developed with, with Ramesh Sampat. So what's the idea? The idea behind it is basically to pre-compute the predictions of a mutated data point along each feature across a range of values. So imagine I've got a data point, and it has 10 features, and the model's predicting some value. For each of those 10 features, I'm going to change, vary that, that one feature across its range of possible values and compute out that trajectory that I described. And I'm going to do that for every single feature across its whole range of values. And I'm going to compute that for all my data points. And that, that takes a long time. That's kind of in the setup of this. But once you do that first pre-computation step, then there are a lot of things you can do. And uh, right now, the, we focused on three things that we're able to do with this package. The first is what we call feature dependence plots, which are basically these ice plots. So I can just say, give me seven points, give me 10 points, and show me a bunch of these trajectories. So I can get a sense of, on individual people, how does my model predictions change when I change these variables? Uh, a second thing I do then is what I call a feature effect summary. So what I basically, what this tries to do is to give a more meaningful representative, representation that, than the sort of feature importances that you might get out of a, uh, you know, a boosting model. And, and we already saw in the, that nice talk by Daria how you know, she was able to show how those feature importances are often can be very misleading and not really very informative. And, uh, I thought it was really interesting, the approach that, that she took on them. This is a slightly different approach where we're just, again, going to think of importance as saying, how much does this variable move the needle across its range of possible values? If on every person and across the entire range of the variable, the model never moves very much its prediction, then you know that that feature just, the model is not thinking that feature is important. It never has a, a, a change of any significance. Now, if it does have a change, there are a couple different ways it can have a change, right? A variable can be significant because on some small number of people, it could have a big impact, or it could have sort of a medium or moderate impact across a wide range of people, or it could be any mix of those things. And that's really what you want to understand when you say, is this feature important? You want to know, is it important because it's just generally across the board on everyone has a pretty significant impact, or is it important because on a small group of people, it might be very, 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 very important. And then the third thing uh, is to explain a feature prediction. So this goes to kind of this question I brought up before about, you know, you've got a patient, your model is saying they're at risk of deterioration, and you want to know why. And one way to, to think about addressing that is to say, well, let me take that patient and compare them to, like, a totally average patient and see what are the factors that the model finds that moves the needle the most when I change the values of this totally average patient to the values of this sick patient. And so we're going to go through some examples of, of how this package works on these. OK. So as my first example, I'm going to start with a simpler data set, housing data. Um, and I pulled this Ames housing data. You can see the, the reference where it comes from. 
it's a relatively small data set. It's only about 2,900 data points. Um, and I split it 70, 30, train and test. And I just chose nine variables. Uh, there were a lot more in the data set, but I chose nine. This is just to give an illustration. I, I fit a boosting model and random forest model. So I started with random forest. Then I did a boosting model that did better than the random forest model. Uh, did not try to, to optimize these. So, so take the, the quality of the model with a grain of salt is really to illustrate the tools and what you can do with the tools and how these tools might play a role in both your model development and your model evaluation. So, you know, taking cut and paste from my uh, IPython notebooks. Um, first thing we did, fit, fit a model, train and test. And, you know, if, if you did the thing of graphing the feature importances, which, you know, a lot of you might have done at some point, you know, you'll see, you'll get these numbers out that say that the overall quality and the general living area, which is the square footage of the house, are the highest on this important scale, followed by the, the lot area and the year built. But, you know, the, this, this scale at the bottom is not very meaningful, right? It's something that's, I guess, normalized to some to one, and it's about, as Dari explained, sort of like this percentage of involvement in the trees. Um, so while it gives you a rough ranking of importance, it doesn't really give you a lot of uh, color as to, to why it's important, how it's important. It's a housing price, okay, so how much does the square footage, how much is the square footage going to affect the, the, the price of my house? So if you use our package, uh, the first thing you'll do is run what we call the model x-ray. So you'll typically give this thing a, a model. And typically, you give it your test set or some subset of your test set. And that takes a while to run. This is going to do all this pre-computation where it's going to change around all these data points across all the different variables and pre-compute all this so that then you can start summarizing this and examining it. So one of the things you might do then is call this feature dependence plots. If You, you can specify specific points, or you can just say, ooh, sorry, give me seven random points. And so here, I've just given it seven random points. And what you'll see is the black dot indicates what the actual starting value for that data point was. So this top row on this first chart for bedrooms above ground was a three-bedroom house that was worth about $450,000. And what this is actually saying, sort of counterintuitively, is that the model would predict that it would actually be worth $500,000 if it was only a one-bedroom house. So. You can think about how that actually, that might make sense, right? I mean, it could be that, you know, there are a bunch of like penthouses in this data set that are saying, oh, if you've got a one bedroom, very big place, it's really luxurious or something like that. So again, I'm not here to talk about whether the model is good or not. I'm talking about how you can use these tools. Certainly it's something you might want to explore, right? And certainly something that if you launch this model without looking at it and somebody said, wait, you're telling me if I had one bedroom less, my house would be worth more? people would, might lose confidence in the model, right? So if you run something like this, you, you, you want to understand that. You want to understand what's going on and either decide that this is some sort of artifact of your modeling process that you should fix or have an explanation so that you could defend why you think this is a good thing. Um, you know, similarly for the, for the bathrooms, you see the same thing on this top house. But, but the thing that comes across these first three variables is all these lines are pretty flat, right? It's rarely, most of the time, these variables are not making any difference at all to the impact of, of the, the house price. Um, but if I go forward, uh, whoops, to the next one, okay, now we see a difference. So this greater living area, which is the, the square footage of the house, you can see on these same seven randomly selected houses, uh, this has a big impact, right? And you can see it's different on different ones and, and you know, Moat for, for that middle one, you know, it actually has a very nice, pretty close to linear arc from about 1,000 to about 3,000 before it levels off. Um, you know, the second of the top one has this weird jump at 1900, or about 1,800, 1,900 square feet, you know, whether you believe that or not uh, in terms of the quality of the model is something you could explore. Um, but certainly you could see that, hey, the living area is an important variable here. And the lot area, likewise, seems to be a pretty important variable. It has a big effect. It can move the needle in terms of the value of the house, according to this model. Uh, number of cars in the garage, not so much. That top one, it's saying 
actually it likes that it has a three car garage and if it was only a two car garage it would drop in value. And then the last three variables, so you see this overall quality, so this is a number uh, that just gen generally when they, when they created this data set, this was a number that was given in the evaluation of the housing process, which basically just says how nice is this house. So you see that that's actually a really important variable. That really moves the needle. So if I want to summarize, though, I want to, what, I, what do I want to do? I want to really just summarize and get the big picture that kind of like the overall quality seems to be really important. The square footage seems to be really important. Uh, the lot area may be a little bit less so, but also important. How, how can I summarize what that is? So the way, the approach we took was for each of these curves, so for example, let's look at overall quality. So on that top curve, it looks like if the overall quality was a 10, we would have had about a value of about $475,000. And if it's a two, it would be $250,000. So for that particular house, the overall quality can make a difference of about $225,000 in the, in the estimated price of the house. Now, for the ones at the bottom, it's a little bit less so. For the ones at the bottom, it's going from like about 150 to 75, so it's moving maybe about 75. So if you think about it, if we take that peak to trough distance and we kind of summarize that across all the data points in our set, that would give us a pretty good representation of how important this variable is. And that's, uh, that's exactly what we do. So we do a box, box and whiskers plot of that peak to trough distance across all the data points in our set. And then we rank them by the median. And so what do you see? You see for the, the greater living area, so the, the box right is the interquartile range. That means that the middle 50% of houses, that square footage has an impact of somewhere between, you know, let's call it 80,000 and $130,000. So what's nice about this is you can actually tie a meaningful number to it. When you say this variable is important, you can kind of say, on average, varying the square footage from its worst value to its best value on the sort of average house, average meaning median in this case, you know, makes a difference of about $120,000. And it's also very variable. And you can see the outliers on the right that in some cases it could make as much as, you know, 200000 um, and likewise for overall quality. And you can kind of see how those two jump out as being the most meaningful variables. Um, then the next one's lot area and the year built, kind of less so, but also significant. And then the other five variables, not so much. Interestingly, full bathrooms in this model and this data set was not found to be particularly important to the value. But what's nice is now you can give a number. Now I built this model and you, somebody says, how does your model work, what does it do? You could say, well, it's really driven by the living area, the overall condition, the size of the lot and how old the house is are also somewhat important. And then it has some minor tweaks for kind of these other variables. And that, that's a nice, easy take home explanation for this. So that's why I think this is useful. Now it's another thing you can do. We have another function which says explain the prediction difference. So you could give it two points and it'll attempt to kind of explain why they're different in price. So I gave it two rows of my data set. The first was a house that was valued at 277,000. The second one was valued at 122,000. And you could ask, why are they different? And what the explanation it comes up with was, okay, first of all, the first house had an overall quality of eight and the second house had an overall quality of six. So if I turn that eight to a six, that would drop your price by $71,000 and it would be only worth $205,000. Next, uh, the first house was built in 2002 and the other house was built in 1914. So that factor, according to the model, drops the price by 34,000, takes it down to 171,000, and so on. You, you knock the living area down, the second house is smaller, it's got no garage, whereas the first one had a three-car garage. Um, now actually you have one shape step that goes in the other way, they say, but on the other hand, the second house had an overall condition of seven, and the first one had an had a overall condition of five, so that actually increased the value by 11,000. And then, but then the lot area was a lot smaller, so that dropped it by 16,000. And then, you, could, you see I specified a tolerance of 0.05 in the, in the call to the function. So that basically says once you get within 5% of the second house's value, 
you know, you could stop explaining. We're kind of close enough. You don't have to give me every, every little delta you came up with. But again, and this is again, sort of a very greedy kind of crude way of going about it. But I think it's, it's helpful to just give a, a big picture of given two points. Why is this one worth more than the other? And if you just want to explain one prediction, a good way to do that is to just pick a really average point and then compare it to your second point. And that's one enhancement I want to make to this. I don't have that yet. It's something where you just give it one point. It'll kind of smartly find the most average looking person in the data set and compare it to that. Another thing this is useful for is uh, comparing different models. Um, so I picked out two of these plots uh, for the two models I did, boosting and random forest. And you know, on this case, the, the boosting did better. And, and if you look at the lot area, that kind of gives you some indication, might give you some indication of why. You see that for the lot area, the boosting seems to be increasing kind of a little more smoothly, whereas for the random forest, it, it has this very sharp jump and then kind of flattens out. Um, and likewise, and I don't know whether this is reading too much into it, so if, if you disagree with me, <laughs> I, I won't argue with you too much. But when you look at the living area, the random forest to me seems to be kind of uh, bouncing up and down a little more. I mean, living area is something you would expect to be monotonic, right? You'd expect in general, as the house gets bigger, it should be worth more. It shouldn't really go down. And I guess one of the boosting curves has a little bump, but, but several of the random forest curves have bumps and, and have multiple bumps. And so that might be an indication of, you know, just a lack of performance of that model, maybe because the data set is not very big. You know, maybe just that boosting because it's able to kind of correct errors in its subsequent trees, does a little bit better at smoothing those things out. But I think these are important things, again, to build confidence in a model, to understand what's going on. It's useful to look at these because then when someone says, hey, why did, you know, why did you give this prediction for this and this prediction for that? It's totally unintuitive. You're at least prepared for it if it does happen, and hopefully you can get ahead of it and answer those questions ahead of time. Okay, so um, first of all, let me just stop. Any, any questions before I go into the second example? Yeah. Classification model. Okay, gonna answer that right now. We're gonna do a classification example. <laughs> all right, so, so in, the, in the second example, um, since, since I, I build this as medical, I picked the medical example. So this is predicting mortality in ICU patients. I use the MIMIC critical care database. You can, you can see the citation. This is a really, really great database if you're interested in, in medical applications. Um, and built a, again, simple data set. Uh, I got 59,000 patients, split 70-30 trained tests, and I took a bunch of labs in vital signs, 51 different labs in vital signs, aggregated them over the first 24 hours in the, in the ICU. Um, also, when I say 51, that's slightly an exaggeration because since I'm aggregating over 24 hours, you have things like the, the minimum in the first 24 hours, the maximum in the first 24 hours, and so forth. So some variables will count two or three different times, like of the, the minimum blood pressure, the maximum blood pressure, the minimum respiration rate, the maximum respiration rate. So it's not 51 totally different things. But I fit a few different models to them. And this is a classification problem. The idea was to predict mortality. What's the, uh, you know, probability of this person uh, dying in the ICU? And so again, the first thing I can do is uh, run that plot. Uh, I had 51 variables. I, I limited it to just showing the first 15 here. And it's a little hard to read, but um, you could see that the uh, respiration rate the average respiration rate it found, this model found, is the most important thing. So basically how fast you're breathing on average over that first 24 hours. Um, the second thing was a little surprising when I, when I mentioned this to a clinician is the BUN, it's the blood urea nitrogen, uh, measures sort of kidney function. Uh, what's interesting about it is that um, it can kind of keep getting worse and worse and worse. And so that was one of the reasons why it was thought that maybe that, that's showing up as big. Um, the next ones, I think, are all pretty, make sense. Body temperatures of, you know, fever and, and, and chills and so forth are important. SpO2 is a measure of how, uh, how well oxygenated your blood is. So when, when, when you start deteriorating, that's one of the first things that they'll notice is that your blood's just not carrying enough oxygen. Uh, blood pressure, sodium, and so forth. 
But so again, this gives you a nice, if you want to just give someone a quick explanation of what's in your model, you can kind of show them here are the top 15 features. And you could get a scale of this again, right? So, so now at the bottom, this is basically your kind of predicted probability. It's an uncalibrated probability, but it's a predicted probability. Um, and you can see that the respiration rate, when you vary it across its range, makes about a 10% difference in mortality risk on average across all these patients. And sometimes, on some patients, can make a really big difference. On some patients can make, you know, even a 0.3 difference or higher. So here are some of those plots. So again, I, I picked, uh, in this case, I just picked five random people. And again, those dots show you where, where they are in reality on this curve. Now, now, one thing I didn't mention, right, is that one caveat with this is that you're varying, you're mutating this one feature. And a lot of times that pathway might take you to some sort of unrealistic place, right? So like, you know, I've got a five bedroom house and I move the square footage down to, you know, 400 square feet, like that doesn't really exist. And, and in this case, especially, I've got things like means and mins and maxes, so I might move the min so that it's, the minimum is higher than the maximum, which wouldn't make any sense. So that's why we made the decision to, to put the points in there so you at least see, okay, what was the starting real data point here? And then what is sort of projected? Um, so it's just a caveat to think about as you use this. Um, so here, you can see the respiration, so I, I just pulled out kind of the most important variables just so you could get a sense of some of the intuition that you might gain from some of this. So you see respiration rate makes a pretty good big difference, and, and clinically this kind of makes sense. It's, you're pretty good until around 20, and then around 20 you start getting concerned, and then at 25 it seems like concern really, really starts, starts shooting up. Um, likewise for the BUN. So the BUN also similarly, uh, you know, uh, I know once you get to 20, that's already a pretty bad value, so it makes sense that it would start climbing up even before that. Uh, body temperature, you can see, has this U-shaped thing, so that, you know, average temperatures are good, but high temperatures are bad and low temperatures are bad. Albumin, uh, this is sort of a measure of liver, liver function, and, and low is bad. And this, again, seems pretty clinically reasonable that at around three, uh, the risk starts going up as you get below three. Similarly, sodium, it starts, you know, as you get between around, say, 145, starts going up and goes up quite sharply around 150. Um, SpO2, to be honest, this one looks a little bit, <laughs> a little bit more janky. <laughs> I'm not sure I would trust this one as much in terms of, uh, you know, SpO2 in general, yeah, when you start getting below 90, it gets bad, but I'm not sure that these spikes are, are necessarily in, in really clinically meaningful values. Um, and again, if you want to explain, here's two patients, why, why, why do you think this one's riskier than the other one? So I picked two patients, one had it model predicted at 2%, uh, mortality risk, the other one predicted 16.9. And what are the reasons it came up with? It says, well, the second one has lower blood pressure, it's breathing faster, and has a bad albumin, bad albumin value. Um, one, other, one other thing I want to bring up just while I'm on this. So one thing with that, that feature effect summary, one thing to watch out for is that Remember, it's measuring across the whole range of values what the, the most effect is. So you can imagine some situations where that might not be great, where it might give you, for example, a false positive. So as an example in the housing stuff, suppose I had a, a variable that was like, is plated in gold? You know, so there's like three gold-plated houses, and no matter what the rest of the statistics are, they're all worth millions of dollars, right? So when it runs that model, it might be like, oh, any house, if it's plated in gold, it's going to be shooted up. So that might come out to be the most significant variable because it has a huge impact on any house would be worth a lot of money if it were played in gold and probably not something you actually want to have as being announced as the, the most important value. So it's something, something to watch out for. Yeah. Yeah, so interaction is hard to account for and that's what we try to address by looking at the, the range of empirical points is to kind of say, you know, for some people it has this kind of trajectory, for some people it's a very flat trajectory. And one nice thing about this, I think it gives you things to explore. When you see 
you plot seven of these curves and see, oh, two of them, they really started spiking up at this value and the other five stayed flat. You can then dig into those two and say, what's different about those people? Um, it looks like we're varying the inputs. Mm -hmm. Same thing happen if you take a hidden node and just sort of like the variance and see what, see what Oh, hidden something do. interior to the model? See what that hidden node might represent, what feature it might represent or something, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, right now we're treating this as a black box, right? So, you know, it's what goes in, what goes out. So we can't move around things inside the black box. So. Okay, so just to, to wrap up a little bit, so where to find more about this? So this is ready. Uh, Ramesh has done a great job, got it set up to go. So if you just type pip install ml underscore insights, you can start playing around with this package. Um, our code is on GitHub, github.com numerous little introspective is the name of, of the particular repository that contains this. We've got documentation at read the docs, ml hyphen insights. So the hyphen, because some places don't like hyphens, sometimes the hyphen becomes an underscore depending on the, the resource. Um, Numeroschool.com is my blog. It's, there's not a ton on there, but if you're interested, you could see me talk about some of these issues. And there's some examples. So all, all the kind of cuts and pastes of pictures are all from IPython notebooks that are, that are available in the example section of that GitHub repo. So if you want, you could just glance through the repo, you could download it and run through the IPython books yourself. And, uh, try it out. So I encourage everyone, if, if you're interested, download it, try it out, send us messages, let us know what you think about it, let us know. We have, we have lots of ideas of things we want to do with it. Um, you know, we basically, Ramesh and I have basically been working like, you know, one day a week we get together and try to crank out some progress on this. Uh, you know, it's not our, not our full-time jobs, but, um, but it's been a lot of fun to work on. And it'd be great if, if, if people also found it useful and wanted to help improve it. Um, I got a few minutes, so I'll, I'll take some questions. Yeah. 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 So that so the question was, you know, if you have two models on the same vari on the same variables and the same data, would they give out sort of wildly different explanations or wildly different curves? Um, and I think that certainly can happen. And I think that's something to play around with, right? If you run three different models and they all give roughly the same explanation, that should give you some level of confidence that okay, we're we're you know. Different people, different you know, people being models, different approaches have looked at this different ways and come up to similar conclusions. If they're giving very different things, then you have to try to think about what does that mean for the model? You know, does it, is it just at a really unstable point where there's so many significant factors and it's coming to different conclusions? Or is it just that you're fitting a lot of noise and, and, and it's just not really a very good model? I, I mean, I think that's really one of the things that comes out of this. When you start using this, I think a lot of reason why people are discouraged from looking at things like this is because it often makes their model look really bad. <laughs> you're almost guaranteed to find something where you're like, oh my God, it's saying this and it's going to be totally counterintuitive and you want to kind of like make sure nobody sees it because you're embarrassed. But, but I, I would encourage people not to do that. That's the nature of these models. I think it's really, really important as we come into this world where you know, these models are more and more a part of our everyday life. I think it's really important to understand them and to expose these examples. And again, it's all in the, how do you improve things? Well, you have to find out where it's acting weird and either explain it and say, no, this is actually right and here's why, or, you know, find a way to address it so that it, it's not so inconsistent. Um, yeah. Right, right. So, so the question for people who couldn't hear was, uh, how would you use this on something like normalized data where you want to normalize, I guess, your target variable you're saying? You'd normalize, or the, or the features. Okay, okay. So if you're normalizing the features before input, well, one, one good thing about this is uh, if you build like pipelines, for example, in scikit-learn, that whole pipeline can be a single model object, right? So you can examine that black box of the raw variables that you actually put in and it'll 
sort of do all of that under the hood. So all those transformations would be under the hood. So then you'd still be able to get meaningful outputs in terms of when you change this raw thing, it would then normalize it inside the black box and then do all its other magic and spit out the answer. Right. Uh, I have not that. So the question was, have I compared, uh, looked at these things under like a normalized and unnormalized model? Um, again, we, 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 we came up with, we <laughs> launched this about two weeks ago that we got the first version running. Um, so I, I've not done that, but I think that's a, a great use case. I think uh, comparing different models and looking at, looking at what comes out of them with these tools, I think is really important, again, to build confidence, to build understanding, and, and to, you know, expose idiosyncrasies uh, about the, the predictions. Right. So, question: How long does it take to run? So that first line where it precomputes everything, it, it can take a while. So, it's just the multiplication of your number of data points, your number of features, and then kind of the resolution that you set of each feature. So it's got to run that many prediction commands. So. Um, you know, on this one, the, the 3,000 point data set it took like a couple minutes for the bigger one, took maybe seven, eight minutes to run that first step. So it's not too bad. And you could play with some of those knobs if you want. You could make your resolution smaller so that it's not, uh, doesn't take as much time. And typically, you could also just take a smaller step so don't run on your whole test set. You just run on like 500 points or something like that. And that'll give you a pretty good idea. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll be around if you want to ask me questions afterward. Thanks.